Olson of megalithicmarvels.com here, and I am honored to be interviewing someone who was just listed as one of our top researchers to follow in 2018, author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, Gary Wayne. Gary, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, so happy to be back to do another interview with you and looking forward to the show and thinking that uh, the audience is going to really like what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I am super excited. And in doing this interview, Gary, I don't want to assume that everyone watching saw our interview last year or even has a broad understanding regarding Giants of Antiquity. Therefore, I want to start at the very beginning uh, by reading one of the most famous Bible scriptures regarding giants, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. And here's what it says. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Quite a fantastic piece of scripture. And uh, Gary, as you so clearly outline in your book, can you please present your case as to how these giants of Genesis could not have just been tall men that came from the sons of Seth copulating with the daughters of Cain. Yeah, and that is obviously two ways of people will interpret that verse is they are, you know, the descendants of Seth or these are angels or beings from heaven or sons of God, depending on how you want to look at that. And so if you have humans mating with humans, then you're not going to produce something completely different. So the word giant doesn't uh, mean a foot taller or six inches taller. You know, Saul was like considered tall, six inches taller or head and shoulders above, but that wasn't considered a giant. And uh, so these were monstrous hybrid beings between the sons of God, who I understand as the uh, angels from heaven and the watchers, as it's noted and named in the book of Enoch, but certainly the seraphim angels, which is key to understanding, um, you know, what they looked like. But these were giants. And we look at in even after the flood, uh, way after the beginning of the creation of these giants and the original ones, we have the Israelites talking about seeing the Anakim. And the Anakim are descendants of giants, which is, uh, goes back to the Hebrew word Nephilim, which is what a lot of people will call a giant, uh, because uh, that's sort of the Hebrew term for them. And the Anakim is a division of the, the Nephilim and are also known as Rephaim, and they all connect back to the Nephilim. And so when we look at what the Israelites said about these Anakim, is, is that they appeared as insects in comparison. So this is not something that's a, a foot taller or two feet taller, but significantly taller. And in the book of Amos, I think it's in 2, two one. it refers to the Amorites, which are hybrids who married into the Rephaim and the Anakim in the promised land. So a little bit more diluted, they were considered as tall as the cedars of Lebanon. And the cedars of Lebanon were the giant trees, which is why the allegory is so important here. And they were the giant woods that were used for construction and beams and all of the great temples and buildings and construction that they were doing in the uh, ancient world. And they grew somewhere between 36 and 40 feet. Some, some people say 50 feet. And so when we look at these two sort of comparisons, and maybe a little bit later in the show, we'll get into a couple of famous giants in the Bible. We understand that they were very, very large and significantly larger than humans. And a lot of people believe that they were somewhere between 20 and 40 feet tall. That's seemingly the general consensus of the original ones, although in the Bible we don't get um, quite that tall of a, a giant. But they were... You know, if we look at, let's say, Goliath, for example, he was uh, six cubits in a span. So if you use a common cubit, which is 18 inches, that would put him at 9.9 .9 inches. I make the case in my book, though, that he was a king. Uh, 
as all of the Nephilim were kings and they usurped the kingship. So they would have used a royal span just as they would have used in the building of the royal megaliths, which is closer to 21 inches. That now makes him about 11 feet, three inches. So now we're talking something that's twice as tall or more than the tallest of the Israelites. Now, not only were they just tall, they were broad. And you don't get it, this in the Bible, but you will get a sense of it when I talk a little bit more about Og. But the average height of, uh, to w a width ratio of a human is about three to one. But on a Nephilim, they're thought to be two to one. So extremely wide. So that's why when Og has a bed that was made of iron, it's made of iron because wood would not hold his weight. So now you're talking about beings that are somewhere between 11 and 15 feet tall, because again, if you use a royal cubit on the bed size for Og, it's going to come close to 16 feet. So it's going to put him 14 or 15 feet, worst case, 12 to 13 on the common cubit style. And that's going to put him somewhere between, say, 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. So we're talking a monstrous uh, being. So this is something that, going back to the original point to quickly summarize it, could not be the offspring of human versus human. And so when we look at who the sons of God are, we need to look at Old Testament references as opposed to New Testament references because this is an Old Testament story. And the sons of God in the New Testament is basically referring to the new covenant where Christians are grafted in after Pentecost to the new covenant. And they're adopted into it as brothers, as sons of God, even though they have human fathers, which is very important to understand. There's a whole series of adoption and uh, understanding of this as an allegory. But when we look at the offspring of these giants, they're not the offspring of human fathers. They're the offspring of the sons of God, which is also a term used in the book of Job. And those are considered to be angels because they're the morning stars in 34 or 38, 4 to 7, you know, that sang in harmony at the creation. And these are the ones who present themselves for God. We can dig into that a little bit deeper um, if, if you like. But I'm just making the case for that these could not have been in my opinion, the offspring of human and a human. If you look at in the, let's say, and I use the, uh, in my book, the New International Version, where it'll say angels in Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 34, or 38, 4 to 7. And it'll have an annotation, and it'll say Hebrew for sons of God. But if you go to the King James Version, it will say sons of God, not angel. And if you go to other versions, it might say heavenly beings, or the heavenly host, or the heavenly countenance. There's many different sort of translations of what they're talking about. Um, but it doesn't specifically say angel there. And where it does in the Old Testament, that comes from the Hebrew word Malak 4397, but it means heavenly host, right? Um, and angels of spirit and, and of fire. And again, as we if we want to understand what these Nephilim look like, we need to understand these angelic terms, particularly as it goes back to the fiery angels called seraphim of Isaiah um, 6, um, because these are fiery serpent-like uh, beings. And so we also have uh, other references to angels uh, that are standing... Um, <clears throat> in front of the heavenly council of God. And, you know, you look at first Kings, they're called the host of heaven that stand around God. And in Job, these sons of God are going to present themselves before God to the throne of God. So again, we have a direct connection. We hear about this assembly of God in Psalms 89, five to seven assembly of the holy ones in Jeremiah 23 verses 18 and 22 called the councils of God. And then there's an interesting term in Psalms 29, one where it just calls the mighty. And the reference is to H 1121 back to Hebrew, which is son. And another reference back to 
uh, 410L, so sons of God again. So I think everything from an Old Testament perspective is pointing to these were supernatural beings. And when we look at the word Nephilim and understand that these were the seraphim and understand when we say seraph, that would be the same as seraphim. I am would be ones. I am and Nephilim would be ones as the suffix. But that goes back to the word Nephil, sort of transliterated into English as N-P-H-I-L, which means, and that's number 5303, that means uh, giants and the Nephilim. But the root word goes back to 5307, which is Nephal, which means to fall or to lie prostate. So if you connect that as these a tribe of giants that connect to the word fall and add I am ones, you have the fallen ones, which refers back to the sons of God, who most refer to as the rebellious angels or the fallen angels. So you have a direct connection in pretty much all of the different meanings to have a pretty safe conclusion that these were sons of God that produced, uh, produced the mighty ones of old, the gibberim, as they're also known as. Not that gibberim always means giant, but in this case, it certainly does. So very interesting. You mentioned that the Nephilim were probably created sometime around 3500 or 3400 BC, I believe. Uh, please share a little bit about how you arrive at that timeline. Yeah, basically I arrive at it two different ways. Is We know from the book of Enoch that uh, he states in, uh, if that book is legitimate, and it does run quite closely to scripture. There's a few er you know, corruptions in there, but it's a fairly reliable source, I think, as a companion source. It says that the watchers went to the sons or the, the human females in the generation of Jared. And in the Bible, we understand that this narrative is taking place in the time of Noah, in the days of Noah. Well, Jared and Noah, even though there's a couple generations apart, Noah was still alive while well, Jared was still alive. So, and so you start to narrow it down into that sort of time frame as to... Uh, when that would have been. And if you do a calculation down from Adam to Jared being born, that, born that's about 460 years. And then uh, you have Noah being born about a thousand years, 1050 years. So somewhere between that point between uh, Jared and Noah, these uh, giants are created. And so the other way to look at it is now, when do we start counting from? That, and that's really one of the keys. And typically, most people will use the year about 4,000. Typically, though, that year comes out of secret societies and polytheism for the year Analusis, for when um, they say that uh, Satan was expelled from heaven. But if I look at taking some firm dates out of the Bible, and some of those firm dates would be the dispersion of the northern kingdom in about 721 B.C., and match that up with the dispersion of Judah in about 587 BCE. And if I didn't say 720 BC the first time, if this is um, make sure that I've said that for accuracy. And then work that genealogy back to the building of the temple in the time of Solomon. And then work in the 400 years that it has between then and the Exodus. And then work the genealogies back. I get somewhere around 4250 BCE or BC for the time of Adam being born. And that could be out a few years this way or that way a little bit. And then I work forward between that 1,000 and 800 years and say somewhere 32 to 3500 BC, one would expect that these giants were born maybe a little later, but not a whole bunch later. Incredible. Uh, in your book, you quote the, I believe it's called the Kibra Nagast, which talks about how all the originating Nephilim mothers died for their physiology could not cope with such monsters. So uh, talk about how these Nephilim newborns were basically delivered through some form of barbaric cesarean birth, correct? Yeah. So when we understand that these are giants to be born, I mean, so these are going to be giant babies. And there's no way 
and, and a lot of people will come to me and say, well, there's no way humans could, you know, bear out, a, a, you know, a giant. And I agree with that 100%. So as it got to the point where they had to deliver the child, they made a choice between the mothers and the to-be-born demigods. And they did like a cesarean birth, slitting open the bellies, killing the original mothers in favor of the demigods that were going to be the new rulers on the earth, the new gods on the earth, the new demigods on the earth. So this was a almost like a pagan polytheist blood ritual sacrifice to the fathers in favor of the of the offspring. It's truly amazing and mind blowing to think about. Let's talk about um, the size of these giants, their traits. I know you talked about that a little bit. Uh, there's a handful of scriptures that speak of the genetic anomalies of these giants. Um, you know and how they had six digits. Um, Numbers chapter thirteen. Uh, one of the other famous scriptures regarding giants uh, states that it's uh, Numbers 13, 33. It says, there we saw the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So this scripture, as you referenced earlier, is speaking to the enormous size of these giants. Um, and in your book, you ask the question, if fallen angels were able to pass on their immortal spirit to their offspring, then what other superhuman traits were they able to equip the new race of people with? Uh, answer this question for us. Yeah, so let's begin with what they would have looked like in terms of being uh, inherited uh, from the parents and then expand into perhaps what uh, other traits they, they might have had. So when we look at the the fathers, the watchers, the seraphim angels, they had the face of a snake. They were the fiery serpents. And, uh, you know, we get that uh, also cross-referenced in, um, uh, in uh, numbers where it has the uh, pole that's going to have the snake put on top to protect the Israelites from the, uh, the venomous snakes. And, those snakes are all called the cash, except for the one that goes on top of the pole. When it goes back to Hebrew, it's not a cash, it's seraphim. And again, in Deuteronomy, we get another reference of these fiery serpents uh, where the word goes back, not to Nakash, but to seraphim. So everything links just as Lucifer or Satan is um, a dragon and a serpent. And so you put that together with the understanding that you put wings on a serpent and you have a dragon. And in antiquity, serpents and dragons were known as the same being. And that's why the gods are all shown as serpents and, and dragons, whether or not it's a plume serpent or it's a naga or it's a seraphim. These are all the same gods around the earth. And as it turns out, there's descriptions coming out of uh, let's say Atlantean mythology and out uh, of uh, Central American mythology uh, connecting back to Atlantis uh, out of the uh, Central American ones where they had the face of a viper. So they had the same face as uh, their, their parents. And if you look at Akhenaten out of a King Tut museum, and this is circa 1250 BC, uh, although some people will push that chronology back to 1400. Actually, I would prefer the 1400, but 1250 seems to be the standard secular chronology for Akhenaten. So this is over 2,000 years from when these beings were originally created. And if you look at him, he's got this extended chin, very high cheekbones, big slanted eyes, and this elongated conical skull. And so he still has this viper look 2,000 years later. It's starting to dissipate. So one wonders how frightening they were to look at in the beginning. And they were known in Sumeria and fairy lore and around the world as the shining ones because their eyes shone. And their voices were so strong that it was like, as they were described in mythology, as Atlas bellowing from 
you know, the, the, the mountains, uh, the whole of a, uh, of a volcano and just, just thundering voices. And Joseph, Josephus describes them as a threat to all of the senses, not only to look at the sound, but they had this strong, strong sort of smell about them as well that was distinct and, and, and different. And that Josephus even puts into the record that they had their bone structure on display in museums, even up to his time, which he would have lived somewhere between, you know, say about 30, uh, 80 and about 100 and was captured by the Romans and wrote the Israeli history so it wouldn't be lost to the world after the diaspora of the Jewish people by the Romans. And that these bones were of a completely different bioengineering than that of humans that they were a wonder to look at. And so we're starting to see a significant picture of not only large, but completely different. And for the most part, all of those other accounts around the world, they would have different colors of skin. Certainly from the Middle East, uh, we have only a pale white skin color coming out. And they would have either red hair and hazel eyes, which is predominant with the Celtic Tuatha Danon and the North American uh, discoveries of giants and the South American discoveries of giants, which are related also to the Picts, which I know the, 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 the Peru skulls are being linked back to more Scottish and also to the Middle East. And that's where you get that connection, because that was also another tribe of the Tuatha Danon coming out of Scythia. And the blonde hair and blue eyed ones that went up to, say, Sweden, Norway, Russia, and into that area. So they had basically two, two color hairs. And so these were very, very different looking at, uh, beings. And they're a hybrid being, of course. We also get out of the Bible that they were great warriors. They were men of renown, men of fame. And if you take uh, uh, where it says um, they were mighty ones, which is Gibran and, and, and um, men of, of renown, that goes back to Seth. And Seth is a name of fame and renown and infamy and of being leaders. And so they were warrior leaders of the antediluvian epoch, which meant they were very skillful, not only from strength, but from the dexterity perspective. And we understand, you know, in Jewish legend and in Greek mythology that they were very dexterous. They were very quick, quick of feet. They were very, very quick with their hands. So they were huge, strong, fast, nimble individuals and frightening to look at. And they shone. <laughs> so, I mean, these, these traits, so these are the traits that we know of. So now we wonder what else did they inherit from these beings that could take a form in the spiritual world to be able to have sex with human females um, to pass on their DNA and their immortal spirit. And so that opens up a whole possibility and the rest now becomes a bit of speculation because we don't really know and we don't have any strong scriptural references to what other traits they had other than some of the meanings of the name that they were very very adept at reading the soil in one of the names and you know things like that but nothing that's really going to give us uh, like a supernatural sort of understanding but typically the biggest thing is is that they had a changeling capability as what the angels would have had and that they seemingly have the ability to go through portals uh, and into other worlds and again that is all speculation I have to tell you that right up front but those would be some of those those other traits um, and what, so whether or not they had telepathy or anything like that again that is all sort of uh, legend and stuff like that so but all of that I think is in play when we're talking about these supernatural type of, of beings right yeah you it, referenced the uh, first century Jewish historian Josephus, um, who has many quotes in his writings about giants. And, and since he mentioned them, I'll read one of them that you referenced. He says, uh, there were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. 
The bones of these men are still shown to this very day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. That's astonishing. It is. And then when we look at those elongated skulls, I mean, those don't look human. And of course, a lot of people will say that you can create that, e that elongated skull just by binding in childhood. And I think that happened a lot. I think they wanted to emulate their kings and their demigods. And these Nephilim all around the world usurped the kingships, both before and after the flood. But what you can't do with that binding is, is create more volume, which these things are significantly bigger than the human cranium. So they had either a larger brain capacity or just larger space and more like a dinosaur. You can pick your poison on that one, but they were able to rule the world and start dynasties after the flood. So these things were not human looking like. And so one would presume that, you know, uh, a changeling capability would have helped them fit in more. Um, and also, I think over time with the intermarriage with humans, I think they lost those traits over time. So you can go either way. I'm more they lost the traits over time. I think they were accepted as the tyrants of old and they didn't care what they looked like. And they used that as sort of a superior understanding because you have all the snake imagery around kingships and gods all over the world. That's inexplicable unless you understand that the gods look like serpents and so did the original demigod kings. Fantastic. Um, let's talk about the giants in relation to the flood and Noah. You write in your book uh, about how Noah had an intriguing relationship with the Nephilim of his day. Um, if you could please paint a picture for us what uh, Noah's relationship with these demigods might have been like. Well, it would have been uh, very, very testy. Uh, and I can't imagine the courage it would have taken for Noah uh, to stand up against these giants. And we do know about there was, you know, a hundred years between um, Noah being sort of selected and the ark being finished and him walking onto the ark when he's 600. And his commission seems to begin um, when he's about 598 years old and he starts to have his children. Um, but of course, there's another 500 years before that. And then we talked about that window. And, Jesus, and Noah was the only one who walked with God at that point in time. So whether or not that was at the point in the flood or it was a diminishing number over those 500 years, he would have spoken against these giants on an ongoing basis. And in other accounts that provide detail about Noah's account is, is he pushed them so often and so hard that not only the giants, but the rest of the people, they didn't want to see Noah. They were tired of him and they were threatening to kill him all of the time. And so he actually had to flee at some point in time, according to these other accounts, and also in the Jewish legends, that uh, for his life and his safety, um, because they were, they were rejecting his word and they didn't want to hear it, because he was talking in the face of these demigods. And again, according to the legend uh, from all these different accounts, is, is they, that what they were saying is, you are a false prophet. And of course, death would come to a false prophet. And they, they said he was a false prophet because he wasn't an angel. And God would send an angel to demigods with the message, not a human. And that's how far astray and away from God that the Nephilim and their mystical religions were, that they had deceived themselves so much that, you know, the commission of humankind, as I explain in my book, is to be raised above angels in the future world. So a human delivering that message would be perfect. And um, you talk about in your book how it's no coincidence that the Nephilim giants are introduced in scripture right before the flood narrative. If you could uh, make a quick connection of these hybrid giants to why God sends the flood. Yeah, so if you, when you read about the giants in Genesis 6, it's a very short narrative. And then it goes immediately into the flood story for the next uh, couple of uh, chapters. And there is nothing really disconnecting the story of 
the creation of the giants with the flood story. It's one narrative. And so I think what we're being told in, in that account is, is that the world had become corrupt with violence, but it was corrupted even more so. And that the giants are the root cause of the corruption that overcame the antediluvian world that brings about the first apocalypse by water. And so the corruption on creating the giants is, would, would have been a violation against the laws of creation. And what is going on is that you're, there is an immortal spirit of God being put into the physical realm, into a physical body, creating a physical God. And so God also steps in in Genesis 6, limiting all life to 120 years of human and human hybrid forms. And this will have a consequence for the descendants of uh, Seth as well. And all life starts that from thereafter to uh, go to 120 years. It takes a few generations to happen. And these beings that lived previously until the time of the flood, um, obviously, um, had longer lives than that. And even Noah lives to be 950 and lives 350 years after the flood. So this takes a little bit of time. And you see that descending um, uh, lowering of the age limit with the descendants thereafter. And this immortal spirit goes into these Nephilim. And because God has sent this edict, what happens is, is the body will die because it's part of the physical world and it doesn't have an access to the tree of life because... Garden of Eden is being is taken away and being protected by cherubim. And so the body will die or they will commit suicide because they're in so much pain. But the spirit's not permitted to go to sleep. And these are the spirits that Jesus talks about in the New Testament that are thirsting for bodies to possess. These are the devils. And if you take that back, it'll, it'll go back to Greek as a daemon and, and evil spirits. And the spirits aren't permitted into heaven and they're not permitted to sleep. They're sentenced to roam the earth. And so we have this, all of this going on as the preamble to the flood story. And this is also, I think, a foreshadow or a connection to that not only was there a corruption with the creation of the Nephilim, I think the whole world had become corrupted. And in research that I link in from around um, it's, and I connect that with what it says in the Bible where it says the whole earth was corrupt but if you look at other accounts from other mythologies and religions you have centaurs and you have uh, elephant people and you have lion people and you have all sorts of crossbreeding and DNA manipulation it seems of animals in the antediluvian world and I think this expanded to the plants and the genomes and the plants as well, that I think they had a level of technology that is what we have today or greater, which is why Jesus has a reference that a sign for the end times will be like the days of Noah. And if our technology and understanding is where it is at today, then that means they were more advanced because we're not in the end time quite yet. So they had this high level to corrupt the whole world. And that's why I think, God called the animals to the ark, uh, not only because he can, but he knew which ones were not infected with these corruptions to replenish the earth and give uh, the earth a new chance with all new uncorrupted plants and with a strain uncorrupted and did not intermarry with uh, the, uh, the Nephilim, uh, you know, born of the sons of angels, because as we're told in other accounts, that there's a lot of crossbreeding going on between the two lineages of Cain and Seth and Nephilim. Incredible. And it's incredible how almost every civilization around the world in their oral traditions, cave paintings, etchings, uh, speaks of uh, a worldwide flood. Um, Genesis 6-4, um, and there's other scriptures like we read, Numbers states the giants were on the earth in those days, but also afterward, meaning after the flood. And, and in Numbers 13, we see, you know, as the Israelite spies are spying out the land, these references to the Anakim. Um, from what you can glean from the scriptures, Gary, uh, how do you think 
these Nephilim hybrids were most likely to resurface again after the flood? Was it was it more fallen angels coming and doing what they did before by breeding with human women, or was there something else? Yeah, and we also need to take into account that not only does it say they were both before and after, um, if we look at what God says about destroying um, all life on the earth, it, he's going to destroy all the life he created. And if you want to be a little bit legalistic on that, it's the fallen angels, the rebellious angels who create the Nephilim. So either way, somehow, somehow they show up after the flood. So I prefer a second incursion, a second and passion incursion. And for the people who may not be aware that the angels who mated with human females, they were sentenced to the abyss for their crimes. And these are the ones that are going to be released out of the abyss in the end time, as it shows in Revelation 9. So if there was a second incursion, this would have been the ones that did not have uh, violation uh, with the laws of creation and with human females. And you know, in Revelations, we're told there are 100 million angels, and it could be even more that, that uh, were created. Um, and uh, a third of them are shown in Revelation 12, at least by the point of the end time, will have rebelled. Uh, Enoch only talks about 200 watchers that went to Mount Hermon uh, out of this number. And we also know they went to more, you know, any human females they wanted to create. So we, there wasn't all the fallen angels that violated and went, were locked in the abyss. So that meant some were still around after the flood. And so what I like for my first understanding that keeps everything more easily intact is that there was a second violation probably at Sodom. Um, which is one of the reasons why it would have been destroyed uh, later on after it had reached its full corruption. And, of course, the Gnostics look at Sodom as the city of light and a replanting of this demigod spirit after the flood. The second way I would look at that would be plausible in my mind as well, although I prefer the first, would be somehow on an ark or somehow with the gods and fallen angels warning uh, these Nephilim because we have accounts like the Epic of Gilgamesh and, and Gilgamesh is two thirds God, one third human. He's, he's partners and a kid and two thirds God, one third human. They're created after the flood, even though on the Dead Sea Scrolls 4Q531 through 534, you'll have Gilgamesh's name mentioned before the flood. We don't know whether this is the same Gilgamesh. Could be, could not be. Either or, you either have a recreation or a survival in Epic. The Epic of Gilgamesh is talking about Apnatishtin or an, and Zayazudra, who is the archetypical Nephilim king or Anunnaki king of the Sumerian tradition, and his family, who are all Nephilim, that are going to survive on the flood. So the Epic of Gilgamesh is similar on a macro level, but not on the detail level. This is a, clearly a survival of Nephilim as opposed to humans. Just as another quick one is the Greek flood story with Deucalion and Pyrrha. Deucalion is the son of Prometheus, and there's two Prometheuses. One's a giant titan, and one is a, a titan god. Either way, Prometheus is Nephilim. So another giant flood story. So you have human and giant flood stories surviving all around the world. And that would be a bit plausible for me, because when you look at Rephaim or Anakim, or uh, Avim, or Horim, or all the, all, all the different names that we have listed for the giants after the flood, the different tribes, none of them go back to the table of nations with Noah, right? And you have Seir, who is part of the Horim, who comes out of nowhere to intermarry with the descendants of Esau, right? And you have Gog and Magog, which are typically... Um, giant names out of Greek mythology that the descendants of Japheth either name their children after or intermarry with the giants. And the descendants of Canaan intermarry with these Rephaim, Anakim, Avim, Azim, all these different names in the Middle East and in the Covenant land in particular. And again, we don't have a reference to where they came from. So those would be the two most plausible ones. I know some people think that some of the wives um, carried Nephilim DNA with them that caused them, but that uh, is, I suppose, is possible. We don't have scripture to support that either, 
And it just seems at odds in my perspective, although I do recognize it's possible that if you're doing a clean start, why would you do that, right, with, with humans? Um, but it's certainly another possibility. You say that the Israelites identified the post-Diluvian giants as Anakites and Rephites, even though they were universally under, understood the giants were descendants of the anti-Diluvian Nephilim. So you kind of just uh, hit there, Gary, on different names of giant tribes. If you could kind of break down for us uh, the various giant tri tribes that purposely settled in this covenant land of Canaan, uh, to strategically position themselves against the future nation of Israel. Uh, all the different names? Uh, yeah, kind of what were the main giant tribes? Right. So let's just again begin with uh, the uh, Anakim. Um, and those are the ones that you're referring to in numbers uh, that is... Um, referring that the Israelites are referring, they look like insects to them. And the Anakim uh, were descendants of giants. So the Anak descend from giants and giants goes back to Nephilim. So, but in other verses, we read like in Deuteronomy 2 that the Anakim are also known as Rephaim. So the quick genealogy is, is that uh, you have Anakim, Rephaim, Nephilim as the parents. And so if you branch out from Rephaim, that Anakim are descendants of uh, Rephaim. And then you read in other verses where you have the Horim and the Zamzumzim and the Emin uh, are also Rephaim. It seems to me that a branch of the giants that survive into the flood sort of go back to Rephaim just as Og is Rephaim, right? Um, and they all seem to be kind of part of that, except for maybe the Amalekites. They may have a different strain of giant in there, but they could also be Raphaim because that's a little bit unclear. And it would also seem that the offspring of Timna, who is a Horim with uh, uh, Eliphaz, as I recall, uh, who produced Am Amalek, takes the name of the giant name that goes back in, into prehistory. And... So those would be sort of the name, the main names that we get out. There's there's a couple more, but oh, there, there's the Avim, which is very important to understand as well. Those are the ones that live amongst the Philistines. Incredible. And you kind of mentioned what some of these um, giant tribe names mean, like Anak means long-necked, the Zamzu mites mean noisemakers, kind of, again, referring back to that Josephus quote that they were horrible to the hearing of the ear. Um, so it's just crazy to think about. I love how you, in your book, you call it the Nephilim Wars. And so yes. I guess backing up for a minute, we've got God wiping out the earth with a flood, which when we look deeper into this, there's actually, it's because of these giant demigods. Um, and then we've got, the, you know, we've got Joshua and Caleb being told to wipe out the inhabitants of Canaan who are actually led and probably mostly inhabited by these giant tribes that are not just human. And so it just, it's a totally different spin on the story. Um, what percentage would you say of these giant tribes did Joshua and Caleb exterminate? Is there a percentage you can put on that? In terms of how many of those peoples were, were destroyed? I would say... Well, we, we, yeah, because we know they, they didn't destroy all of them, yeah, correct? that's true. And they didn't destroy all of the giants, and they didn't destroy all of the, the hybrid peoples that intermarried with them. So Amorites would be a very tall nation, but they were offspring of, of the giants. And so you would have had Raphaim kings ruling over them, like Og and, and Sihon as example. Um, but they weren't as pure as this, this, uh, this other line. So, um, and they didn't exterminate them outside of the covenant land as well, right? So the ones that would have lived outside there would, would have still survived. So, but within the geographical area, I would say they probably wiped out about 80% of them, just my own estimate. They did a lot. Um, and it took, uh, you know, years and years and years of perpetual war. 
In fact, uh, to the point where Joshua becomes so tired in old age that, you know, they're just tired of perpetual war. Um, but they would have wiped out a lot, but they didn't wipe them all out. And they certainly didn't wipe out the five Avite kingdoms of the Philistines. And there was also pockets all around. But, I mean, the number of kings and armies and cities that they wiped out is astonishing. But this is not a slaughter of for the purpose of bloodthirsty slaughter. These giants purposely moved into the covenant land because they knew that was the prized land of God. And they were violating that and waiting in ambush for the Israelite nation to be born, raised, and come back. And what they were attempting, just as the Amalekites were attempting to do, is wipe the Israelites from the face of the earth. And because... We, if we understand that, then we understand, we have to ask, well, why would they want to wipe them from the face of the earth? Because Israel is brought in as a nation of priests to deliver the Messiah, to uh, be atoned for all the sins, antediluvian and postdiluvian of all humankind, so that we might be raised above humans in the future time, raised above angels in the future time. And so they're going to try and prevent that. And... They're also going to try and inherit the blessings thereof through the Esau line and intermarried through Amalekites of the Messianic birthright and blessings and covenant blessings that come with it. So there was this whole sort of political thing going on from the spurious forces to try and wipe Israel out. But they laid there for centuries in patient wait to try and defeat the people of hope and destiny from completing their commission. Well, wow, so much there to think about, to research. Uh, I love how you tied that all in. Let's talk about some of the specific giants mentioned in the Bible. Um, you say that the giant king known as Og of Bashan had an iron bed 13 feet long and was the last survivor of the Rephites. Please tell us a little bit more about King Og. Yeah, and that is a very interesting reference, the last survivor. Um, and, uh, you know, that's recorded in uh, Deuteronomy 3.11, 13.11 to 13, and Joshua 12.4. So that's more than just one account. And so King Og was uh, a very obviously famous giant because he's the one who's going to fight against Moses um, and Joshua uh, just before they're going to cross the Jordan. But what happens first is, is Moses goes through the land of Og's brother Sihon um, and has a battle with them and uh, kills Sihon, wipes out the army. Og comes in support of his brother and uh, same thing happens to Og. And so this was a one of the most famous people of early post-Diluvian epoch. I mean, he was a great warrior, a great knowledgeable person. He's written them. We have archaeology um, supporting um, that reign and in that area, uh, and particularly referring to the Rephaim, just as you have the Wheel of the Rephaim, which is also known as the Wheel of the Ghost, which is another meaning for the demon spirits of the Rephaim. And so this is a very powerful king before they even cross the Jordan, and they, they defeat two of them. And they're the leader of the Amorites as well. As we mentioned, they are hybrid beings or offspring of the giants. But it's that word, the last surviving of the, of the uh, Rephaim, that is very important to understand because as we did the connections before about who the Rephaim were and how they connect to Nephilim and all these other races are Nephilim, and that when Joshua is going to cross the flood, he's going to fight all of these other Rephaim, whether or not they're Anakim or Avim who, or whoever. And in the time of Goliath, in the time of David, you know, over 400 years later, Goliath is from Rapha, Rephaim, as it goes back to Hebrew, as you take that word giant. And that's part of the Avim group out of the five uh, city-states of, of, of the Philistines. And so clearly he's not the last Rephaim. So what does that mean? Does that mean he's the last original, either produced after the flood or survived the flood, 
of of the original giants. I think that's what it's pointing at, and that's why it's so important. And it's there in three different verses, so it's not there out of just a sort of a penman's anecdotal note that doesn't have importance because it's recorded three times. Incredible. You write about uh, the most famous giant in the Bible, uh, Goliath, king of Gath, who led the Philistines and was about 10 feet plus tall or more. And he belonged to a family of giants. Please expound on the origins of Goliath. Yeah, and we get this um, out of Jewish legend that connects in with uh, Scripture. And uh, who I'm referring to are these Jewish legends, not necessarily the Kabbalah, even though they'll have similar accounts. Uh, I preferred on the Jewish legend to refer to Lewis Ginsburg, who collected all of the Jewish legends. And some, you know, they match up quite well with the Bible, but they do stray and probably embellish to a certain degree. But they look at uh, Goliath being from uh, a, a relative of David um, and connected through Ruth. And Orpah originally travels with Ruth back to Israel, um, but then decides she doesn't want to live there and goes back uh, to her homeland. And she sees a shining, powerful being, a descendant of the angels, ride through and is instantly awestruck with this individual and marries her. And she's the daughter of a king, Oprah is. So, um, again, royalty marrying royalty and she produces four or five sons depending on which legend that you're going to produce and one of them is Goliath and so this actually makes Goliath and David related because Ruth is in the descendancy of of uh, David and Ruth and Orpah are related um, but of course I'm not suggesting David is giant because I'm, I'm clearly putting through where this offspring came from, from, from this uh, fallen angel. And what's interesting is, is that you have five rulers of the Avene city-state empire. And when David goes to fight with Goliath, he picks up not one smooth stone, but five smooth stones. And I think that if God was with David that day, and he was, he would ensure one stone was going to be enough, uh, and it is, and David cuts his head off after knocking Goliath out. But I think he took the other four stones because he was fearful that the other four leaders would come out and want to fight with him afterwards. So he was going to be prepared to take on all five giant leaders. And we never hear of these other giants with the Philistines, we only hear of Goliath. And we also understand that there was many other Avim or giants that were part of the Philistine armies that would have been part of the armies that day and that are later killed by David and his mighty men afterwards after David comes to kingship and wipes out most of the, the giants that we're aware of and the balance of the Amalekites uh, for attacking Israel way back during the time of Exodus as part of his kingship covenants. Incredible. It's incredible to think about these, uh, these giant tribes, you know, the Philistines, for example, led by Goliath. And we know that God um, outlawed, you know, child sacrifice and the spilling of blood. Um, but it's crazy to equate how, if you were a human living back in those days and you went into the Philistine camp, Goliath was literally seen as this giant demigod, this half god, half man creature. Um, who wouldn't you? Would you agree? He most likely probably ate children. I would think so. Uh, they did the worst abominations. Um, they were. I mean, if you l look at what how David was approaching. Goliath. He was approaching him like he was a spiritual beast and had nothing good to say about them. These were beings that were the enemies of humankind. They looked at us as, in, in, as uh, inferior, as sub-whatever hybrid human they were, and that we were only good for servitude, ritual sacrifice, eating, and drinking our blood. And both 
were significant tributes of the antediluvian epoch. And we take it from that, that they continued these traits because they continued all of their other ways after the flood. Yeah, because, you know, I always thought in reading the scriptures, you know, how uh, even the Israelites got caught up in, you know, sacrificing children. You picture them bringing their child to, you know, some statue yeah. or some, you know, stone god when in reality it could have been a living giant that was cannibalistic and consuming these sacrifices. Yeah, let me connect those dots a little bit for the for the audience. So the Nephilim outside of Israel were the kings, and they start these royal dynasties. And they're in partnership with the mystical religions, and everybody knows you know, the Magi out of Mesopotamia and the powerful priests out of Egypt. These are the same religions and the same organizational structure. And the Nephilim king was known as um, what we would know as a priest king or a fisher king as it comes down through grail mythology that was both a priest and a king in most cases. And if somebody reads the lost king of book Og, they claim Og was a priest king as well. This would just, I'm not saying it's an accurate book. I'm just saying that is how they were believed to be. And as a priest king of the bloodline of the gods, they were the gods representative and messenger on the earth with the divine right to rule. So they would be continuing on these rituals. Now, if we understand what the Canaanite pantheon looks like, that starts with the uh, generic name for God, El, which was a morbid, lustful, violent fallen angel who mated with human females. He creates Baal. Um, and uh, Mot is another one of his sons. And also the son of Baal is Molech. Now, Molech is the god that is the choice of worship at the time that these kings would have been worshiping who demanded child sacrifice. And this is why you have all of this Molech sort of thing going back and forth in Baal worship in the time of uh, the Israelite kingdom because this was the land of the Canaanites before. So that religion wasn't wiped out. And this is what infected the Israelites which is why God had instructed them to get rid of all of the idols, get rid of all of the people, keep it clean. Otherwise you will be infected. So interesting. Um, the book of Enoch states how the Nephilim corrupted everything, even animals. You've kind of hit on that. In chapter 83, I believe of your book, you talk about, um, as you just stated, the legend of Molech, who's like, you know, this man with a bull's head. Uh, you talk about the bull of, um, Minos, a hybrid uh, bull man creature who is also a child consuming cannibal, I think on the island of Crete. Mm -hmm. um, there's the legendary Cyclops, uh, who was said to be a giant, or these were giants with an eye around the forehead. And I find it so interesting to tie this in that uh, there's a certain type of ancient megalithic architecture known as um, Cyclopean masonry. Yeah. Um, that's found, especially in the Turkey area. Uh, of the world and you know when you study the oral traditions of these a lot of these megaliths and the cyclopean masonry it's connected to giant giants who built this stuff and uh and i i went to peru this last year and got to see some of these megaliths up close and if you haven't seen i mean we're talking precision cut megaton megalithic mortarless blocks that are so so fine you can't fit a human hair through them and uh we're talking some of these are 50 tons 100 tons or more in weight um literally made with some kind of lost ancient high technology that our greatest modern engineering today uh, can't replicate um and it's crazy when you go to peru and you go to machu picchu and alente tambo and uh pisac all these great archaeological sites you know uh, if you don't know any better you're just told this was built by the Inca but when you look closer you see that everywhere the Inca went underneath the foundation is this megalithic ar architecture which looks far superior um, and interestingly enough was all uh, 
destroyed, that's why there's only the foundations left, by some ancient cataclysm, um, which I believe was most likely the flood. So um, do you believe that correlation, Gary, of megalithic architecture with this lost ancient ancient technology on a massive scale, two giants? Yeah, I think there could be two levels of uh, ancient architecture. Um, typically, if you get into polytheist religions and uh, mythologies, is, is the first ancient cities um, were all built by the gods before um, humans were created. And then afterwards, and particularly as you start moving into uh, secret society and Freemasonry legends and history is that the seven sacred sciences um, that were taught to Adam, uh, learned by Cain um, and expanded by Enoch, son of Cain, not Enoch, son of Seth, and down to Lamech and Tuval Cain, that they developed these seven sacred sciences along with the watchers, along with the angels and the illicit uh, knowledge from heaven to uh, a level that I had mentioned earlier in the show is probably greater than what we have today, which would testify to some of these monuments, and that the Freemasons and other groups in the Middle East, especially in Arabian mythology, they will equate the technology and the knowledge to build the pyramids and, um, you know, the Great Pyramid in particular to Enoch. Um, he's known by different names in, in, in different um, uh, cultures, but they all take them back to the Bible of uh, the Enoch of the Bible, but not of Seth, of the seven sacred sciences. And that in many of these accounts, they had giants working with them, um, but not necessarily were all of the labor. They were part of the labor. I think they had developed their technology to a level that would have enabled them to do that with the help of the angels. And if we look at how fast our technology is developing today, and you, you add into it, many people think this is, is what's going on today, is that our knowledge is being advanced and enhanced by fallen angels, and that was going on in the past. How fast could that technology advance, and how far did it go in one or 200 years? And we know these giants were around for hundreds of years. Wow. Well, one more question for you today, and then I'll let you go. I know you're a very busy guy, and um, we, we touched on some of this earlier, but all over the world, uh, giant bones, giant skulls have been unearthed. Uh, ranging mostly from probably 7 to 11 feet in length, often found with red hair, extra digits, double rows of teeth. Um, you can do a search of old newspaper headlines from the late 1800s into like the 1930s and read reports about giant discoveries, you know, really found all over almost every state in uh, the U.S. about these giant discoveries. And these bones were usually taken to the universities to be studied and then never really seen again. Um, amongst the many fakes that are on the internet, there are a handful of uh, genuine photographs, I believe, of giant skeletons that people have uh, taken, of giant mummies. Um, we talked about in uh, Paracas, Peru, and some other places, these elongated skulls with red hair have been unearthed. Um, they're about a thousand years old, I believe. And DNA analysis on some of them has actually verified the elongation, as you stated earlier, wasn't just caused by a cranial deformation, but rather it's genetic in that, and I think this is so important to point out, that the skull's cranial volume is up 25% larger and 60% heavier than conventional human skulls. Um, meaning cradle headboarding can't create more mass, as you said. Um, and then it just as recently as last year, um, by, uh, Brian Forster um, from Peru has revealed the discovery of some infant-looking um, humanoids uh, that died in the womb and had these massive elongated skulls. Again, proving it couldn't have been cradle headboarding. It was genetic. And they're about 800 to 1,000 years old. Um, so I guess in closing, um, to me, that seems to be some pretty uh, decent evidence that we can actually see and touch and measure 
um, that connects us back to the genesis of giants and the Nephilim wars. And uh, any closing thoughts on this possible evidence we have today connecting it to the giants of Genesis? Well, I think it is the giants of Genesis. And so, you know, as we talked about earlier, you have these two main colors of hair in the Peruvian skulls and North American skulls, they tend to be related with red hair, which is that red hair hazel eye sort of variation of, of, of these Nephilim. And what we also get is DNA results taking it back to European and Middle East, and particularly Scottish, um, um, tracking back through history on DNA. And so we have two possibilities here. I think you have that after the flood, you either have uh, more races around the world surviving, or you have these giants being driven out of the Middle East, who, according to more European legends, whether or not it's uh, Greek, whether or not it is uh, Iris with Tuatha Danan, whether or not it's uh, other Celtic, uh, Northern German, Scandinavian, Scottish, have these waves of these giants like Gog and Magog and Albion and Brutus and all these other ones migrating in different waves with different names like uh, Simri and Trojans and, and, and as such moving over to France and to England. Uh, and then either moving, being pushed out from there, perhaps again over to the new world, or it's a separate branch. I think it's probably being pushed out of the Middle East. I think the source of the giants of what we see surviving have this Middle East connection, whether it's through Scythia, whether it's through Tartarus, through legend and escaping from the prison the giants were put in for rebelling afterwards. Um, but I am open to the possibility that there are other ones survived around the earth uh, with the flood as well, either through help of fallen angels or on arcs or on mountains. There's many different sort of stories on that, but I think um, they are probably part of the same ones that are, that are from the Middle East, I think. Well, Gary, thank you so much uh, for your time today. This has been so insightful for me and I know for many that are watching and um I would tell everybody watching, please go to genesis6conspiracy.com. That's six, the number six, genesis6conspiracy.com. Uh, and there you can find um, all of Gary's social media channels to follow. Um, get on Facebook and get up and, and get join his Facebook group. It's very informative. People post a lot of great content. And of course, Gary um, has a lot of cool um Facebook posts with pictures that he adds often that I really enjoy. Uh, they're kind of like mini little books <laughs> that you post. <laughs> so uh, follow his Facebook uh, group, follow his Facebook page, Twitter, um, but most of all, buy his book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, it's an incredible book, and he goes way more in depth on all these topics that we've discussed, and way more. Uh, you will get your money's worth. And um, and also, please share this video if you enjoyed it. And so, Gary, thank you so much. Well, thank you uh, for having me. It was a, a wonderful time talking about this subject. And I think um, just as you do, I, I love talking about this to topic. And for anybody that's out there, if they do have a question, do get a hold of me either through my website or through Facebook or through Twitter. And uh, I, if you have a question, I will get back to you on it. Thanks, Gary. Keep up the great work, and we'll do this again soon. Thank you.